to talk uh, to you about uh, two examples, actually, that illustrate how we can uh, use ancient DNA, ancient pathogenomics in order to understand concepts of evolutionary biology uh, better. So I hope you had a great workshop um, until here. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with a bit of a more general concept, which is the question, what do we actually study in the context of evolutionary anthropology, as this institute is about, and archaeogenetics, as we do in the um, department where my group is located, when we actually uh, work on ancient pathogens. So we have um, actually, I would say, two main concepts that we are focusing on, um, and that is on one hand history of human diseases and on the other hand the evolution of uh, human pathogens, which are in a way two concepts that are different um, on one hand, but that are also quite uh, tightly entangled with each other. As the way uh, diseases influenced uh, human life, influenced human populations, is highly relevant for human history itself, but also the way that humans change their lifestyle uh, and their subsistence strategies is in turn highly relevant for how the evolution of human pathogens um, have been shaped. And this is uh, actually something that we would like to study in context with each other. So um, I would say that studying the evolution of human pathogens and the history of human disease tightly integrates into studying the uh, history of humans and, and their evolution. So um, as a very first step, I would like to give you some uh, ideas what we need to do in order to actually study uh, human pathogens. And some of these concepts might overlap with lectures that you had before. So I will keep it short in my introduction, but I would like to give you um, a bit of an overview about some concepts that are relevant when we talk about studying um, evolution of pathogens from the ancient DNA perspective. And what I forgot to say at the beginning, so I'm not monitoring uh, the chat right now, but if you would like to uh, type questions into the chat, you can do so. So I will look at them at the end uh, of the lecture uh, and try to answer them. But of course, you can also leave your questions for the end um, of the lecture and then just uh, ask them through the microphone, through the chat, however you want to do it. So we will do that um, at the end. So first of all, um, one of the, the first steps that we need to study uh, human pathogens from ancient archaeological remains is we need to find them um, and searching for traces of pathogen DNA in such old uh, material is really like looking for the needle in the haystack, as the pathogen DNA is actually only present in very low amounts. I've given a very rough breakdown here. Um, of course, host content is highly variable, so that can be 10%. I just put this arbitrarily here. It can be 50%. It can be below 1%. So we have a high variation there, but the vast majority in general comes actually from environmental bacteria. At least if we are screening materials such as bone um, or teeth that has been uh, buried in the ground. In this case, we have actually a very strong contamination, I would say, from environmental bacteria, but also from some uh, environmental uh, eukaryotes. The actual pathogen DNA, if it is present, um, is only there in very tiny amounts. I put as an example 0.1% here, which is indeed realistic, can even be higher, 0.2%, and only in very exceptional cases substantially higher than that. However, often it is even present in lower amounts, like even only 0.01% of the DNA from a shotgun sequenced um, archaeological sample is from the pathogen that we are looking for. And this is a challenge because we need to be able to distinguish it, um, these DNA fragments, from DNA fragments that actually originate from uh, bacteria in the soil. So I'm talking about bacteria here. Many of the ancient pathogens that we are looking into are bacterial. We are also uh, looking into viruses. 
Um, and there the situation is also highly variable. So some of them are so specific that they are easily to, uh, to distinguish, um, but others not. And for bacteria, it is the same case. Um, and to illustrate that, just one example here. So this is actually uh, a small experiment that we did in the context of a review paper a couple of years ago, um, because what one could think, uh, what is something very straightforward to do, is basically just take the shotgun data that we have retrieved uh, from an archaeogenetic sample and map it to all kind of pathogen genomes that we are interested in. So what we did here is actually we used um, a number of uh, sequencing data sets from various so uh, sources, for example, human saliva. Uh, these were healthy humans actually from a medical control group. Um, environmental samples such as ocean and soil. And we just took these data sets and we mapped them to a couple of uh, bacterial pathogens in this case. And what you see on the y-axis here is basically the reads per million that were um, that could be mapped to the pathogens of interest. So you see on the very uh, left side, for example, Bacillus anthracis, so the causative agent of, of anthrax, then we see Bordetella pertussis, whooping cough. Um, we see uh, Clostridium botulinum, botulism, Mycobacterium leprae, the uh, causative agent of leprosy, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. We have uh, Stamella typhi, so typhoid fever, Treponema pallidum, syphilis, or yours and or other related diseases. We have cholera and Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of plague. And you can see that to all of them, we have actually quite a number of reads uh, mapping. One might say 100 reads in a million, that's not a lot, but as we are really looking for tiny amounts, you can imagine if we have like 10, 20 million reads, we would get like um, 1,000, 2,000 uh, mapping reads to the pathogen of interest. And we might then think, OK, we have a hit. So you see, this is not working. When we use healthy human saliva, when we use environmental samples such as ocean or soil samples, we get mapping to all of these pathogens. So that is actually something um, that is not indicative of actually having the pathogen present. So for this, um, we can use various taxonomic classifiers, and this has been uh, covered in other parts of the course. I just want to introduce one pipeline that we have been using actually to detect the candidate samples um, for the projects that I would like to introduce today. So we are using uh, the HOPS pipeline uh, for that. Um, a PhD student, Ron Hübler, and the postdoc, Felix Key, have been primarily um, working on that in the context of my group. Um, and here we use uh, MALT, which is one tool for aligning metagenomic uh, reads to large databases. Um, there are other tools that can do that, such as Kraken, um, Metaflan, and others. Um, as, what is a specific feature of MALT is that it actually performs full alignment. So it's not alignment free. Therefore, it's also slower and it needs more memory, but it actually gives you um, the, the full alignment of the reads that you are assigning. So it aligns the reads to large uh, databases that contain genomes from um, all bacteria that have been sequenced so far. And it performs a taxonomic assignment. So for every DNA fragment, for every DNA read, it can actually decide how specific that read is, if it is specific enough to identify a species, or if it has to be assigned on, on genus level, on family level, um, and so forth. And then it performs these assignments. So it can actually then tell you if you have reads that are aligning to, say, the plague bacterium Yersinia pestis, are they specific enough to identify this species or not? What we do in a second step is we, um, added, uh, we added a module here called MALT Extract that is actually able to operate on the results that MALT produces. Um, that is able to operate on the exact alignments that I was just talking about. So it takes for a, a list of candidate species. So we have more than 100 pathogens that we are looking for. And um, it takes actually the reads that have been assigned to these species and checks them for various features of ancient DNA, as you have heard about um, in this course already, such as DNA damage patterns, for example. So we know that... Uh, uh, ancient DNA reads 
should actually exhibit a certain damage pattern. So this is something we can look for. But they should also have other features. We can, for example, look into the length distribution of these DNA reads, um, as ancient DNA fragments tend to be much shorter than uh, modern uh, DNA fragments. We can also check, for example, how the read alignments are distributed on the target genome. So if the reads truly originate from that genome, we would actually expect that the read alignments are randomly distributed across the genome. However, if they primarily accumulate in uh, specific conserved regions of the genome, regions that can be found in uh, multiple bacteria, then we know that we might have an issue with these reads and that they might not be um, indicative for that species. And it might actually happen that MALT has missed that um, due to the fact that the databases we are working with are largely incomplete. And this is something we can actually not avoid, as most species uh, that live in the environment have not been sequenced so far. And this is actually a situation that we will um, have to deal with for many, many years to come. So we can investigate these additional features that um, allow us to authenticate ancient DNA uh, and can make a decision if a certain candidate that we have detected in a sample is um, a, a true candidate or likely a true candidate. And then we can continue to work with uh, that sample. Now, I don't want to talk more about uh, ancient DNA authentication and metagenomic classification as this has been part of other uh, teaching units in this course. But um, I would like to actually come to two examples of pathogens that we have been uh, studying in our department and also colleagues of us in the field have been studying um, and that are good examples to illustrate how the evolution of pathogens can actually be tightly integrated with the evolution of uh, human culture. And where do we start in order to look for such an um, example? There are, of course, multiple uh, time periods that we can look at. We can go centuries into the past. We can go millennia into the past. Um, and we have, for this endeavor, actually picked a time period that was highly uh, relevant as a, a time period of turnovers in human culture. And that is uh, the time of the so-called Neolithic revolution or more uh, pre uh, precisely referred to um, as the Neolithization process, as it is really not a process that happened within very short time, but actually um, that spread over multiple millennia across Eurasia and has changed uh, the lifestyle of human societies from a more hunter-gatherer uh, lifestyle and a foraging subsistence uh, strategy to a lifestyle of uh, pastoralism and agriculture that is therefore very much focused on livestock. And that has really changed the way humans are living with each other and humans are living with uh, uh, with animals. So humans uh, tended during this period to live in, in larger communities than before, uh, some populations becoming more sedentary than it was um, before. But even in uh, pastoralist societies, definitely uh, living also in, in closer uh, groups, potentially settlements, as we can see here on this artist's illustration, but also closer to their livestock. And as you can imagine, particularly considering the hygiene conditions um, that were present at that time, living close, uh, closely together with, with the livestock um, of these human groups have, uh, has actually opened opportunities also for pathogens uh, to cause zoonotic infections. So for pathogens that were largely infecting animals, also infecting humans, and therefore exploring new ecological niches uh, for these pathogens and also create opportunities for them to adapt to a new host, the human host. Um, and this illustrates actually nicely how changes in, in human lifestyle and subsistence strategies could have opened at that time and at other times new niches for uh, pathogens to evolve. So for the first study that I would like to um, introduce in this context, 
we screened more than 2,500 data sets that were geographically and temporally related to the time of the neolith uh, neolithization process um, in Eurasia. And one pathogen that we actually found uh, frequently is uh, Salmonella enterica. So I would like to give a bit of an introduction into this bacterium. Salmonella uh, enterica is actually an, an extremely diverse uh, bacterium. It's a gram-negative bacterium that we know nowadays in most contexts from uh, contaminated food. So food poisoning, for example, salmonellosis of a various sort. Um, there can be salmonella uh, uh, isolated from the uh, environment, but there are also several rather host-specific so-called serovars, so types of uh, salmonella that infect uh, specific animal species or that infect specifically uh, humans. And one of these uh, serovars is salmonella typhi, the causative agent of uh, typhoid fever. But there are also others called paratyphi A, B, and C that cause uh, paratyphoid fever. Now, these are the so-called uh, typhoidal forms of Salmonella enterica. These bacteria are basically specialized to um, enter the, the human system, so basically to become systemic as an infection. Um, they can replicate in, in macrophages and can infect not only the gut, so they are not just gastrointestinal, uh, but cause systemic infection, for example, infecting other organs um, and becoming potentially septic and uh, killing the patient. So for the typhoidal forms, that is actually highly likely. But there are many other types of salmonella that are non-typhoidal, so they uh, have less of an ability to cause systemic disease, but they still do in quite a number of cases. So even the, the non-typhoidal forms that are less likely to cause systemic uh, disease do this in about 10 to 20 percent of all cases. Um, and contaminated food, as I mentioned before, contaminated water are the typical sources for um, infection. So primarily in, in Africa and Southeast Asia, um, these types of salmonellosis are uh, a huge health concern. So when we um, look at the samples that we were actually been uh, that we have been able to actually reconstruct from this time period and the geographic region, this is um, how they distribute. So you see, we have a handful of genomes here, but they span first of all a quite large geographic range, but also a quite large temporal range. So what you can uh, see there in the top right, we have actually our two oldest samples about 6,500 years old. But you see the age of the samples in the label. So we have samples from uh, the Neolithic Bronze Age. We have samples from the Roman period. And if you uh, pay attention to the uh, panel in the top left, we have actually here reconstructed uh, by a group led by Mark Achtmann, a medieval sample from Norway. Um, and we have an earlier publication from uh, our group, a sample from a colonial burial in uh, Mexico, so um, from the 16th century. And that was um, a very exciting finding for us because this uh, epidemic burial ground was attributed to uh, um, a significant disease that is referred to uh, as the Cocolitzli epidemic uh, in colonial Mexico. And it is estimated that in some regions, up to 90% of the populations have actually died from uh, this disease. So we found Salmonella enterica in multiple individuals of one of the burial grounds. I would like to mention, we cannot say for sure that this was the only pathogen that caused this uh, devastating epidemic, but we do believe that it definitely contributed uh, to it. Now, this is where uh, these samples come from and how old they are. So let's look a bit into the diversity of Salmonella enterica, how we know it um, today, and where our ancient samples basically fall in this diversity. So you can see here a phylogenetic tree that encompasses more or less the full diversity of Salmonella enterica as we know it from today. 
And you see here highlighted in, in orange, the human infecting uh, forms. So at the bottom, you can see typhi, so the causative agent of uh, typhoid fever and paratyphy A. The two of them are actually pretty common nowadays. But all of the ancient samples are fall in this branch highlighted in red. And I would like to zoom into this branch and uh, show a bit of a more uh, closer phylogeny, as we can see here. So you see here basically the branch that we have been looking at in the, in the large phylogeny. And you see all the ancient genomes that have been uh, reconstructed from prehistoric times in, in red and uh, historic times in pink. And what you see here is that the oldest samples that are about 6,500 years old they fall um, towards the bottom of the tree, as you can see here. And they have been isolated from individuals, uh, from groups that were still performing more of a, a foraging lifestyle, so more of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. However, these groups are often referred to as being um, transitional foragers in the sense that uh, um, hunter-gathering was still their uh, primary subsistence strategy but still maybe having some contact to livestock already. However, all of the younger forms, and I zoom in a bit more here, um, all of the younger forms of Salmonella enterica that um, we were detecting were actually isolated from individuals that uh, were part of groups with a more pastoralist lifestyle. And this is what we see here, as I said, um, highlighted in red. What you can actually uh, see in orange are the modern representatives of this type of salmonella. And these are the forms paratyphy C, typhi suez, and cholera suez. Paratyphy C is a type of salmonella that um, is adapted to human, that specifically uh, infects humans, whereas typhi suez infects pigs, and cholera suez can infect both pigs and uh, humans. And for this reason, so uh, with respect to this infection pattern, it has been hypothesized that this type of salmonella actually originated from pigs um, and was potentially introduced into the human population due to pig domestication. However, when we go to these older forms of salmonella that we have isolated from, uh, from human populations, these were human groups that did not have pigs as their domesticates, but other animals, for example, cattle um, or goats, maybe uh, sheep in some uh, context, but uh, not pigs, um, at least most of them not. And this tells us that probably this type of salmonella did not originate from, from pigs. However, it also tells us that animal domestication probably played a huge role in the evolution of this type of uh, salmonella. Not specifically pig domestication, we rather think that um, this type of salmonella has been introduced into pig populations by humans, so it was more an anthroponosis into uh, an animal reservoir instead of the other way around. So we see for the uh, two historic genomes from the colonial time period and the medieval time that you see here in pink, um, towards the top at the basis of paratyphy C. So th these two isolates, or actually we have uh, for both sides multiple isolates, where um, or can be classified as paratyphy C. So they fall ancestral to the paratyphy C diversity. However, we also looked into virulence factors. And there is one pathogenicity island for the sake of completeness, I mentioned it here, it is actually called Salmonella Pathogenicity Island 7 that is um, relevant in the uh, virulence of paratyphy C that is already present in these historic forms that um, we saw in uh, colonial Mexico, but also medieval Europe. Um, so from that, we conclude that these types of infections have actually been typhoidal um, at this time, so that a high frequency of these infections actually became systemic. And I would like to emphasize at this point that we are likely only seeing systemic infections. So these are all um, 
strains that uh, or where we have been isolating DNA from, from teeth. So when we find uh, material in teeth, when we find DNA of pathogens in teeth, we can actually conclude that this pathogen has caused sepsis because otherwise we would probably not find it in a tooth. For, some, uh, for Salmonella, this means if we have a gastrointestinal infection that is not becoming systemic, it can still um, kill a person, but we would probably not find the pathogen in a tooth in this case. Only if the infection becomes systemic, enters other organs, eventually the bloodstream becomes a sepsis, and then we would expect that we find a good amount of pathogen DNA in the blood, and therefore we are able to detect it. However, we do not think that these um, early forms, the prehistoric forms of Salmonella are necessarily typhoidal because they are missing this pathogenicity island that I have uh, mentioned before. Still, they were obviously able to cause systemic disease because otherwise we would not find it. So from this, we um, conclude that the evolution of this type of Salmonella towards um, a host specific form uh, and a typhoidal form was closely linked to this change in human lifestyle with uh, more domesticates living close to the domestic um, animals and performing a more pastoralist lifestyle. However, I would um, also like to introduce another example of um, a case where we think that human behavior and human culture actually facilitated the, the spread and evolution of uh, this type of disease. I would like to introduce another study here that we performed with uh, colleagues from uh, Jilin University working on a, about 3000 year old cemetery from the uh, Tian Shan mountains. And this site actually represents an important trade hub. So we see from the archaeology, but also from the human genetics, um, a large amount of uh, mobility for this for this region um, related to the site. And we actually therefore think that uh, this is also related to the spread of pathogens. And I will uh, show you why. We have actually detected multiple pathogens in uh, the cemetery, and Salmonella enterica is uh, one of them. And when we check where actually this type of Salmonella is falling in the diversity that we have identified before, it is actually falling right there. So at the basis of paratyphy C, typhi sewers, and uh, cholera sewers. So at the very point where the diversification process of these types of uh, salmonella starts. And these strains have um, a number of mutations on their own, but they are actually really falling very close to this ancestor of paratyphy C, Typhi sewers and um, cholera sewers. So um, one interesting aspect is that we were able to identify multiple strains. And one of them actually already contained the pathogenicity island that I have mentioned earlier, that is thought to be specific or nowadays seems to be specific to paratyphy C in this part of the phylogeny. Interesting enough, the same pathogenicity island can actually also be found in Salmonella typhi, so the causative agent of typhoid fever. Um, and what I did not mention before, I would like to mention it here, is that um, Salmonella typhi and paratyphy C cause very similar symptoms. So clinically, it can be very difficult to actually tell them apart. So from this, we conclude that this site actually being related to a very important trade hub, and therefore the high mobility in this uh, area, uh, trade routes that are sometimes even referred to as the proto-silk route, contributed to the spread of pathogens such as Salmonella enterica, but also others. Now, I've already been talking about uh, disease mobility, mobility of human populations, changes in in human lifestyle and how this might have shaped the evolution of, of pathogens. Is there actually anything we can say about disease ecology 
at this point. And we can, of course, not perform phenotypic experiments. This is not possible. We can only work with what we know from the ge uh, genomic results. But there is one proxy that uh, we wanted to look at in order to make statements about the ecology, and this is pseudogenization. So I would like to introduce the concept of pseudogenization first. It is a process by which genes become non-functional, for example, due to a point mutation that results in a stop codon, or an insertion deletion that results in a frame shift. And now the question is, why is that not negatively selected? One might think if there is a mutation in a gene that is highly relevant for the organism um, and makes the gene dysfunctional, then the organism would just die, would not survive, or at least have uh, a huge fitness disadvantage. And therefore, this mutation would actually not be maintained in the population, but would be negatively selected. But in the case of pseudogenes, that is not the case, so the gene becomes dysfunctional and stays dysfunctional within the uh, population of the bacteria. And that can be because the function is not needed anymore. So there might be a change in ecology, for example, a different ecological niche that this bacterium now populates and a certain gene function is not needed. It can even be that the function has a negative effect, the function of the gene, and therefore the uh, inactivation of the gene is even positively selected. So how can this be? How would a gene even evolve that has a negative effect for the bacterium? Well, certainly it had a positive effect at some point. A good example are uh, motility factors that allow bacteria to move in the environment to a certain extent. Often these um, motility factors are a disadvantage when the bacterium evolves into um, a pathogen as these cell surface factors of various sort um, are a target for the immune system. So the immune system can actually use them to recognize the, the bacterium and attack it. And also at the same time, motility factors are potentially depends, uh, not needed in the same way by a, a bacterium that becomes a pathogen. So then often these genes are even negatively selected. Um, there might be a gene duplication. That can be another reason. So a gene is being duplicated. Uh, therefore, the function is maintained and one copy can become uh, dysfunctional without a negative effect. Now, we are more looking for the, uh, for the previous two points. So genes that become dysfunctional due to a change in the ecology uh, of the organism or even because um, uh, the, the presence of the gene the gene function is negatively selected, for example, due to being exposed to an immune system. So often pseudogenization or high frequency of pseudogenization is used as a proxy for uh, pathogens that are more host adapted than others. And this has been described not only in Salmonella, but also in um, other bacteria. So what we did here is we basically calculated the pseudogenization frequency in our ancient strains and compared it to the pseudogenization frequency of all kind of uh, modern salmonella isolates. So what you see in this graph on the uh, y-axis is, is the frequency of pseudogenization on the x-axis just sorted in order all of the genomes that we have been investigating so that are um, from the diversity of uh, salmonella enterica. And what you see in yellow, orangish colors are basically strains that are rather host adapted, so that uh, infect specific animal hosts rather specifically, where what you see here in more bluish colors are strains that are more host generalists, so that are isolated from various um, animal sources and that are not specific to a certain host species. And what you see in red are basically our um, ancient strains. Um, and what we can see is that except for our uh, strains from colonial Mexico that are basically at the very beginning of this yellow part of the spectrum, all of the prehistoric uh, strains are more falling into the blue part of the spectrum. So from this, we conclude that um, these ancient strains were actually not host-specific at that time. But as you can see here, 
the uh, younger these genomes get, um, for example, then moving to colonial times, medieval times, the more host specific they become. Um, and therefore we can nicely see how the involvement of host specificity actually happens here over time. And we hypothesize that this is closely linked to uh, human cultural evolution. So really keeping livestock, enabling the, the pathogen to easily jump between hosts and therefore uh, also due to this frequent zoonotic events, um, give an opportunity to the pathogen to basically evolve into a host adapted, into a human adapted form. I would like to show um, one more aspect about uh, pseudogenizations. What we also checked is, do we find pseudogenes that have emerged at multiple points in the tree independent of each other? And we have identified a couple of, uh, of genes that have not just been pseudogenized once in the tree, but multiple times, and that we find in multiple lineages specifically adapted to different animal hosts. For example, at the very top, we see a gene that has been pseudogenized in human-specific varieties, in pig-specific varieties, horse-specific, sheep-specific. So we see that this gene is independently pseudogenized in multiple salmonella strains that have adapted specifically to a certain animal host. And we can see a similar behavior for a number of, of genes. And with that, we think, um, although it is in uh, an individual case for a gene hard to uh, define the function if we have not the possibility to study the phenotype, but we can actually see that we have here a certain form of selection pressure potentially that drives a number of genes into pseudogenization in the context of becoming more host specific. So we see actually Salmonella enterica here as an example of a human pathogen that is um, on its way to becoming human specific, closely linked to uh, cultural evolution and changes in human behavior. So I would like to present today, however, a second example um, of a pathogen that we find during the same time period, which is also for that pathogen crucial for its evolution. And that is the plague pathogen Yersinia pestis. What you see on this um, painting from the early 18th century is actually a scene from the Great Plague of Marseille, which was one of the last plague outbreaks in uh, Europe after the Black Death. And the plague bacterium Yersinia pestis is certainly most known from the uh, Black Death that uh, caused millions of um, deaths in uh, Europe at that time, in medieval Europe. And however, what we know by now is that plague has been around for much longer. So this time period, so the Black Death and afterwards is often called the second plague pandemic. The first plague pandemic actually took place during uh, the Roman time, starting with the Justinianic plague. But we know now that plague has been around for much longer, uh, already in the late Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, which is something I would like to talk about here, but even earlier than that. So about 5,000 to 6,000 years before present, we can already find and identify plague. And this is a, a pathogen that we have been working on a lot in various time periods. So we have been working on medieval plague. We have been working on the first plague pandemic. We have um, also projects going on on modern plague. And many of our colleagues are working on this pathogen as well, many colleagues from the field. Um, so we have been putting this together here and also enriching it with more uh, strains in order to perform a bit of a more high resolution analysis of various features of this early type of, of plague. So by now, for example, um, by uh, colleagues from other DNA labs, we have from vast spaces across Eurasia and time periods, plague strains, for example, very recently published also from, uh, from Great Britain, about 4,000 year old plague that has also reached this part of Europe during that time period. And you can see uh, here a certain coloring pattern. So you can see 
uh, strains depicted in, in pink um, and also uh, some depicted in, in blue and green. And I would like to come to these different types of plague that we have identified during uh, this time period. So what you see here is actually the phylogenetic uh, tree of Yersinia pestis. And this is really the complete diversity of Yersinia pestis as we know it today. Large parts of this tree are, uh, are collapsed. And what you see at the bottom of this tree, or towards the bottom of this tree, we use Yersinia pseudotuberculosis as an outgroup here. So you see these very early forms of plague that have been identified by, by colleagues that are depicted here in, in blue. And one type of plague that we have by now um, quite a resolution for is depicted here in pink. And this refers actually to the samples that you also saw in, uh, denoted in pink on the map before. And you see this very long branch that basically uh, contains all of these samples with relatively low diversity on the side branches. So we have rather the one straight branch that um, goes from the Neolithic into the Iron Age with very little parallel diversification. So any kind of side branch dies out relatively quickly. What you see in, in orange more to the right are actually the radiocarbon dating intervals of all of these samples. So you can see that they basically fall into the phylogeny um, very much like uh, they are also dated, so according to their age. Um, and here you actually see that we have various types of plague. They are not falling all on the same branch. So if you, we go a bit more further up, we actually see the two genomes depicted here in green. And I would like to uh, compare these branches a bit because the branch that you see in pink and the same is true for the more ancestral branches in blue, these types of salmonella are actually lacking uh, very important virulence factors. Um, such as YMT, which is one very important virulence factor that allows the bacterium to survive in the gut of fleas um, and also multiply there. And this is the way someone, uh, uh, Yersinia pestis transmits nowadays. As we know it from modern strains, it is basically taken up by fleas from infected animals, primarily rodent species, and it is able to replicate in the gut of the fleas, forming a biofilm, basically blocking the flea gut. So the flea cannot feed anymore. It bites um, lots of animals, potentially also uninfected ones, and thereby then transmitting the bacterium to a new uh, animal host. But of course, that can also then happen to the human host. So particularly when rodents live close to humans, and they die uh, of plague and the fleas basically go onto the human host and trying to feed and thereby infecting humans. However, the human host is actually not the primary host, as I've mentioned. So rodent species are the primary host of um, the plague bacterium. And the human host is more like one can even say an accident. It's basically a dead end for the bacterium. At least nowadays, human populations would not sustain um, the, the bacterium anymore um, in any form, therefore not being a reservoir for, uh, for this bacterium. So these virulence factors that are important, I mean, I just mentioned one, there are actually others that are highly relevant for flea-based transmission or for effective flea-based transmission. And we find them in this uh, green form that we see a bit further up in the tree, but they are absent in the branch that we see here in pink or the even earlier branches that we see in blue. So actually we don't know how these early forms of plague have been transmitted. It might be um, a form of fecal oral route, like it, we actually know it for Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, but it is actually really hard for us to, to estimate how these forms have been transmitted. But now that we have a higher resolution on this branch of genomes, we can actually look a bit at the phenomenon that I have indicated earlier, so that we see here a rather linear trajectory of evolution within this branch. 
um, that we see here in pink. So we do not uh, see a lot of parallel uh, diversification. And this is actually something we try to measure. So what you see here is actually a comparison of uh, three measures. So first of all, the genetic distance between um, all of the plague samples in the branch I have been indicating, uh, all of the pairwise temporal distances, so basically the, the distances in, in age, in sample age, and all of the pairwise geographic distances in uh, kilometers. And what you see here um, is in the top left, a correlation between genetic distance and temporal distance for the late Neolithic Bronze Age branch that was depicted in pink in the previous plot. And we see here a strong correlation between genetics and time. And you've seen this already in the tree, considering the radiocarbon dating intervals that we have, an extremely close relationship between the age of samples and where they fall in the phylogeny. And this is what we can see here now as a measure. The plot in the top right is actually considering the very same samples, but correlating genetic distance with geographic distance. And you see here that we actually do not see such a correlation. Um, and this is often also called a phylogeographic pattern if it is observed so that certain uh, parts of the phylogeny are primarily being found in uh, certain geographic regions. But we do not see this for this type of plague. Um, so we have a strong correlation of genetics with time, so with sample age, but not with place. And this actually tells us that this early form of plague was highly mobile. So we do not have the formation of geographic specific reservoirs that we would then also see in the phylogeny but we have a highly mobile form of plague. As a comparison in the row below, so in the bottom uh, left, we see a correlation between genetics and time for Yersinia pestis also, but here the second pandemic. So basically the type of strains that caused the Black Death and outbreaks in Europe afterwards. And we see that we have also here a correlation between genetics and time, but it is much weaker than what we see in the late Neolithic and Bronze Age. And also here, bottom right, no correlation really between um, uh, genetics and uh, geography, or only very weakly. So what we wanted to do in addition to um, what you see here is compare this to other species. So not just comparing Yersinia pestis to Yersinia pestis, but also comparing that to other species. So we are now only looking at the genetic distance and correlation with temporal distance. And here again, what I've shown you before, this is Yersinia pestis um, Bronze Age with Yersinia pestis second pandemic. But now what if we go to Salmonella enterica, what we have been talking about before? So how does it look for Salmonella enterica? And if you recall the tree, we actually did see quite some parallel diversification. So although all of the salmonella that we have reconstructed so far, they all belong to the same part of diversity of uh, all salmonella enterica, but still they form uh, quite a variety of branches within this diversity that evolve in parallel to each other. And therefore we have only a very weak correlation between genetics and, and time in comparison to um, our earlier Xenia pestis. So we see uh, an even stronger phenomenon there if we actually move to another pathogen, which is uh, Mycobacterium leprae. So Mycobacterium leprae, the causative agent of um, leprosy, I don't want to show you a phylogeny here, but um, what we see here basically is the complete absence of correlation between genetics and time. And when we look into studies of early Mycobacterium leprae from ancient material, we see a very interesting phenomenon. And that is that um, even at uh, various cemeteries from various uh, time intervals in Europe, we often see a large part of the diversity of Mycobacterium leprae represented in one single cemetery. And that is quite striking. And that tells us that multiple rather different Mycobacterium leprae lineages 
were surviving at the same time at the same place. So we have no close correlation between genetics and time because we see more or less all the diversity or at least large parts of the diversity at any time and at multiple places. And that is not the case for plague where we actually um, have a strong correlation between genetics and time. So we have been uh, talking about pseudogenization before in the context of Salmonella. We can also look into this with uh, Yersinia pestis. And um, the very same genomes that we have been looking at before are here sorted by time from bottom to top. So the older ones being at the bottom, the younger ones in the branch being at the top. And we see here that the pseudogenization frequency goes up so that we have more and more pseudogenes accumulating during the evolution of this branch. And what we think this could indicate is that this type of Yersinia pestis is actually in the process of adapting to a very specific ecological niche. What this niche is, we don't know. Um, but we do think that due to the absence of the respective virulence factors, it is not a niche that requires flea-based transmission or effective flea-based transmission as the more recent uh, forms of plague actually do. So from this, we um, can actually see that the prehistoric Yersinia pestis was widespread across Eurasia. And from the evolutionary pattern we see in the branch and the correlation between genetics and time but also the absence of correlation between genetics and geography, we can conclude that it was not just widespread, but also highly mobile. And this evolutionary pattern, in addition, points to a single well-connected reservoir. So either it was a, a reservoir in a specific place from which we have actually spillover events into the human population and highly mobile spread all the time, or we have a rather large animal reservoir, for example, that is very uh, strongly interconnected, um, where we have actually one type of Yersinia pestis, one lineage evolving within this reservoir with frequent spillover events into the human population. There are also some colleagues who speculate that it might have been a human disease, so that humans were the reservoir for this type of plague. And I mentioned earlier, maybe, uh, maybe being transmitted uh, through the fecal oral route and therefore being sustained within the human population. So at the end, it's something we don't know yet. We do see the parallel spread of lineages with different ecological background over millennia. So I've mentioned the other type of plague that was depicted in green in the tree that already had all of the virulence factors for a highly efficient flea-based transmission. And this lineage was basically existing contemporaneously to the other lineage. So we can speculate that both types of plague were infecting humans during uh, the same time period, but in different ways, potentially. So with this, I would like to come uh, to the end of my lecture. So here is a bit of literature that I would like to recommend in uh, this context. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions.